Blasé and Douglas from the Open Microscopy Environment. And there, let me go last time. And Brian, thank you for surviving this long time to, to see this talk. I'm very happy that I can survive it. Thank you again for organizing the work. Uh, I will be presenting the topic of uh, informatics and uh, bioimaging, or in general, how open source software uh, in the subject of domain can be used and how it facilitates uh, new uh, par paradigms and uh, user behavior. We are from the Open Microscopy Environment. Um, uh, my name is Blasio Budelski, uh, Douglas Russell. I'm a core developer of the project. Douglas is a external developer uh, from uh, <coughs> Oxford. I'm from Dundee, Scotland. <coughs> so thank you for having us, Blasio. Um, so the problem that Open Microscopy tries to solve is uh, basically the data management and analysis in life sciences. Uh, vast amounts of data uh, can be generated by a uh, image acquisition system, which can be a digital microscope, which is in itself very expensive. And uh, that data has to be stored in raw form. Before I carry on, I just wanted to ask one question. Does anyone have any uh, background in biology or uh, computational science in general? Okay, that's, <laughs> that's okay, that's fine. Uh, so, as an example, uh, the IT infrastructure in Dundee, which runs around 400 terabytes, 13 terabytes of uh, data infrastructure is already taken up by images generated by uh, acquisition systems from size, Nikon, uh, other manufacturers. Uh, and an uh, image is treated as a measurement. I'll explain in a second why is that, and uh, why, why and how it undergoes quantitative and qualitative analyze, 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 analysis. <coughs> And an example you can see, uh, those are pretty images, quite colorful. Uh, they, in, in two dimensions, they, they look quite uh, appealing, but what can't be seen here is the spatial information, the temporal information, multi-channel information. So those, those, in reality, those are multi-dimensional images, and each channel, each uh, modality has to be captured uh, in the real data. Hence, uh, hence the size of the captured data, and, and hence also the drive towards sharing resources. So open access to those images uh, drives uh, and facilitates the lack of repet re repetitive uh, experiments, which means that the scientists can uh, look at a scientific paper, can validate instantly the results by looking at the raw data that's been uh, bundled together with the paper. Systems like that already exist, and they are driven by uh, open microscopy. Uh, and uh, how that all happens currently, the, the let's say 20-year-old workflow that could have happened in uh, uh, biological uh, laboratories. There is a data acquisition system, uh, or image acquisition system to be specific. Uh, images taken by a microscope uh, are treated as raw data and then close, uh, trans transferred to the next stage in a closed uh, source format. So each manufacturer of a microscope tries to log in their users into their specific file format, their specific uh, desktop client. Uh, so sharing that image between uh, scientists in a single re lab or between uh, lab groups can be very, very hard and uh, frustrating, especially if you work in a facility where computational time is being bought by, by the hour. Uh, then uh, what happens with the closed source format is being uh, reduced in resolution for presentation and rendering in the client. And also the access is uh, local, so uh, not many uh, pieces of software make use of the client server paradigm that has been uh, in use for uh, now many years. So, seeing the workflow, one might ask how how does OME fit in? So, uh, the consortium that we both represent. OME tries to be this, this broker, this glue that sits in between uh, the image acquisition system, the users, uh, the presentation and storage uh, elements. We don't solve all problems for, uh, for the scientists, but uh, we try to uh, solve the ones that are um, the most common. And we also, under the OME umbrella, facilitate cooperation between uh, commercial partners as developers, open source projects that build on top of our API. Uh, so we try to uh, basically facilitate cooperation. Uh, what uh, I mentioned about complex images, uh, this is an example of a 281 megapixel image that's being posted in the JCB Data Bureau. The JCB Data Bureau is an online web application that builds on top of uh, the technology that we produce. 
and allows the users to uh, interact with the images in a very uh, cohesive way. It, the data in JCB data viewer is also open and ready to download, so it's attached to the uh, DOI of the uh, scientific article. So if someone reads an article and wants to see instantly the raw data uh, that uh, was the source of the uh, results of that article, that uh, project, that website basically facilitates. Uh, there are many other examples like that, like the Stowers uh, data repository. Uh, so many academic institutions uh, work on top of our open source project and uh, adjust it to their specific needs. I also mentioned that uh, multiple modalities Im in images uh, uh, come from the fact that there is also metadata attached to, uh, to this image. So here's an example of gene phenotyping, which uh, has to go along with the image itself. The image without the specific data being presented in this way is just basically uh, half of the value of, uh, of the whole result. Uh, that complexity also means that user interfaces or the way how an image is imported into the system or uh, um, uh, used by, by the user is becoming complex, so we have to put more effort into designing the user interfaces so that they are uh, intuitive. Speaking of metadata, uh, this is a part of our data model that uh, runs on the server and uh, is being used to capture all the metadata that comes from the uh, image acquisition system. Here is an example of uh, an instrument that has a specific objective uh, used with it, a specific setting of aperture, uh, light source, a filter. Uh, that all is visible in the clients that access those images. So if someone wants to see instantly what type of uh, uh, apparatus has been used to capture this specific image, it's all available for the user. This is also uh, then ex uh, exported into XML, so uh, OMTIF and OMEXML are two uh, parts of the whole project which allow easy uh, exchange of that image. So if someone exports, uh, let's say, a Nikon uh, proprietary file format into OMTIF, they can give this image to any scientist that wants to see it, and if that scientist works either on Omero, which is the product that we uh, provide to users, or any OMEOware uh, piece of software, they can instantly import that image and not lose any data on the way, and work with it without any uh, without any uh, uh, being fenced into this uh, specific uh, format. Uh, looking at the implementation details, uh, there is the server itself, uh, which uh, based, is based on uh, a technology uh, for uh, for the middle layer called uh, ICE, produced by Zero C. That's the same uh, product used by, by Skype uh, to facilitate uh, pub, pub, pub sub type of technology where multiple clients speak to a single server or multiple servers. Uh, there are two clients that allow the user to work with their images, uh, visualize them, annotate them. Uh, and uh, work with them. Their one is web-based, the other one is desktop-based. Uh, additionally, the data store is uh, based on PostgreSQL. Uh, we use also Hibernate, we've seen for uh, full text search. Uh, and we, I think, achieved a certain cohesion of uh, the tools that we use in the project to give the best uh, results to the users. Uh, I mentioned clients, so uh, this is Omero Insight, the desktop client written in Java, runs on uh, Linux, Windows, and uh, Unix operating systems. It's extensible if you Google for Omero Insight agent, you, there is a very nice documentation how you can write your own plugins for it. There's a public API that allows uh, whoever wants to really do anything with it to extend it there in their own uh, way. Uh, it also uh, as I mentioned, uh, metadata is visible on the right. There is a full image viewer with uh, region of regions of interest, uh, rendering of multiple uh, Z slices through a, a biological sample, uh, handling of big images. So the zebra fish was an extreme uh, extreme example, but uh, usually images in uh, life sciences can go up to very very big uh, resolutions. Uh, the web client is trying to give the user the similar look and feel and type of uh, workflow. So also uh, the main image viewer, um, a data browser where one can see data sets and projects. Uh, we also facilitate a permission, permission system. So if you imagine a laboratory being divided into research groups, one can easily uh, model that in our system and assign specific users to specific groups and uh, model the permissions between each other's data. Um, 
This is based on Django, uh, so Python web framework on the client side. There is JavaScript <coughs> uh, run to give users this kind of a one-page application feel, and uh, it's also extensible. So again, the API uh, generated from the source by uh, Slice. This is a ICE component. Is Python based, so someone wants to extend the Python code by all means. Also, the JavaScript is available and annotated so uh, people can see the openness of the project. They can trust the algorithms that we use for uh, image uh, rendering and analysis. And uh, as users told us at our users' meetings, you know, they like it more than you know, working with a size or on a piece of software where they don't really know what's happening inside. And can we trust that the raw data that goes through it will uh, remain uh, as uh, uh, the same measurement as, as before? And on that note of extensibility, I want to hand over to Tago to explain more about the concepts. So I'm going to talk a little bit about extensibility and then how we sort of relate to the open source world. <coughs> so everything in red here is, uh, is a place where we can be extended. And everything in blue is the core system itself. So as well as you said, you know, you can extend the Java client, you can also extend the web client, you can extend um, the server itself by adding new services to it. And also we have like a scripting engine, so you can write you know, image analysis algorithms, and then they can actually be run through some grid infrastructure. Uh, and a lot of that we get from, from Zero C, so we, um, for free, by building on top of that. Um, it's also nice because clients can, you can write them in any language and uh, on any platform, and we get a lot of that. So as well as you said, the, the microscopy world is really proprietary. All the instruments being built, I mean, they cost like hundreds of thousands of pounds in some cases. So they've obviously invested a lot of money in it and don't want, and would like to lock you in as much as possible. So what generally happens is they've written some specific acquisition software which comes with their instrument. So and then it outputs a specific format. So you're already locked into Delta Vision or you know, some Zeiss format for, for whatever microscope it is that you've got. Just in my group in Oxford, we have uh, we have about 12 different types of microscope, and we've got eight different image formats that, that come out of those. And each of those can only be really analysed in the tools that the that the hardware vendor provided. Um, but with only XML, we can start to build generic tools which can then be used by anyone um, on any image format. So is anyone from academia at all? Oh, a few people. So I think it's, it's not always a natural fit for academic software to become open source. I think there are a lot of reasons for this. Like, one is just that people are afraid of uh, having some sort of maintenance burden, like they're obligated to provide service, and um, or they're just worried about losing their IP. Um, I think maybe the, maybe the most compelling reason is that um, a lot of the software in academia is put together quite quickly, so the quality of code hasn't adhered to like strict software engineering principles or anything like that. So there's sort of a reluctance to put it out there because people might laugh at you or, or whatever. But um, but in OMB, we decided to go down this route. By, so we leverage existing open source software. And it's really crucial because we have this. Um, we're trying to make everyone adopt what we're offering. And if we don't make it open, then I guess people might not choose it. Uh, but maybe the most compelling reason that we're uh, uh, open source is that uh, one of the founders of the project, actually, Edward Solomon, lived in his basement when he started the project. <laughs> So as, um, as academics, we're, we're, you know, we rely on academic funding to continue our work. And um, as time goes on, I think the funding agencies are realizing that more, it's more expensive to do an open source project. Well, to do a project of sufficient quality that you're willing to put it out there and try and keep it going for a long time. And I think it's slowly being realized that putting more money in makes it uh, more sustainable in the long term instead of it just being mothballed, which I have, think happens to a lot of academic projects. The project comes to an end, the person who wrote the code disappears to another job, and the code just disappears into, into nowhere. So obviously we'd like to keep our jobs by continuing funding, but we're also trying to reduce our, um, 
reliance on academic funding by making it more, making it easier for um, community contribution and for people to apply for their own funds to contribute to Emera from wherever it is that they're from. So we have this kind of consortium model. I'm from the University of Oxford, Elijah's from Dundee, and uh, this is just this is just the people who are uh, sort of invested in the project at a, at a funding level. But there's also loads of other people who are invested in the project at a community level. Um, and we try and actively solicit developers who are working in a microscopy or biological environment because they have such a unique perspective on what's really required and they can build individual tools which then are actually useful to users. Uh, that, that's what I am, so I'm at the University of Oxford uh, building tools which are specific to our users. So there are tons and tons of, of tools in image analysis and for, well, for various tasks to do with images and my other microscopy measurements and up until this point a lot of them would only work with some image formats but as time goes on and um, we can import more pro more um, image formats into our only XML if if the projects then pick up only XML as one of their supported formats then you get a big win there for free uh, so you start to be able to use the best tool for the job rather than whatever tool you have to dictate to by whatever image format you happen to have. Uh, so, Omera has a, well, the only project has a commercial app, Glencoe Software, um, and a dual license for all the software. It's pretty crucial because, um, as I said, like the hardware lock-in means that without having this facility, uh, the, the commercial vendor's not so willing to work with you, so you have to be able to release it in some sort of commercial sense as well. Um, but encouragingly, some of the vendors are beginning to, to use only XML as a primary um, acquisition format, which is that's really that's really great. And all the time, we're seeing pressure from from all the users of of the Mera software on the um, on the commercial uh, microscope vendors and image analysis software providers to support to support us more, either in terms of just supporting the model, or also in terms of uh, pushing data into Mera and getting it back out. So we're funded by the Wellcome Trust and the BBSRC. So we have some obligations to our funding bodies, obviously. But generally, uh, our project direction is determined by the community. So we're trying to build something that works for people. So that's what we that's what we want to try and do. Um, if you want to find out a bit bit more about OMI, this is a good place to start. So there's a, this is our organisation on on GitHub, and uh, or you can also find the OMI website, which has a huge amount of information on it. So there's just some people that are on the project and stuff. Obligated with literary images from the Welcome Trust. Uh, and any questions? Any questions? So uh, I was I was really glad to hear again the the the, the, the standard refrain of the, the problem of the quality of software that comes out of PhD projects uh, you know, the abandonment of scientific code. I'm a fellow of something called the Software Sustainability Institute, which is a UK thing that's uh, set up to try to address this kind of thing. Um, so, uh, you know, I was wondering what, 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 what your feelings are in terms of one, of one of the questions that we're addressing in our campaigns there is for those of us who are research software engineers, you know, we're, we're working in universities to, to create research code, there's often some tension around creating software versus writing papers and that kind of thing. Which is why you know, one of the campaigns we're doing is to try to say we are research software engineers rather than general RAs or whatever and, and give ourselves a label. Um, how, is, how, how does it work for you well, in your project? In I think in the, in the OB project, definitely the, the focus is, is on writing the software and getting it out. That's, it's always... Uh, I think it's just fundamentally organized that way. Certainly the, the project that I, I used to work on, there was always the pressure to publish as well, and we wrote half as much code because we spent so much time doing that. But I, I think um, OMI's just set up that way. You know, it's all, it's all about writing the software. The papers are necessary, but secondary. There's also quite a big team, so yeah, some people can do some. And exactly the work that other parts of our whole consortium do uh, sometimes translates nicely into uh, a paper in a specific domain. So 
Uh, if you Google metadata, metadata matters, there's a, there's a paper published on, uh, on metadata that's being used on the XML and the data model. And we, I guess we are lucky enough to be able to basically publish that when, 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 when the time arises. So I think, uh, I think when you've got the scale, you can yes. do that. You can have the division of labor within, I, within the team. I mean, I with that well, we're also we're funded mainly by a uh, um, strategic award grant from the Working Trust. So it's designed to, to provide a platform, I mean, rather than uh, publish in a specific area. OK. Yeah. Um, can the project import all the different proprietary formats, uh, or do I have to rely on the um, on the um, microscope vendor in order to, uh, to provide? No, so, the access so to on, on uh, the basically, what happens is that some there's a certain level of cooperation between the the vendors and bioformats, which is actually the library which we use to do all these imports. So, how much they collaborate determines how easy it is for us to write the, the import software. But uh, there's a lot of reverse engineering going on when, it, when, it's, <laughs> when they're not cooperative. Yeah, we, don't get the, you know, we, we don't get the specification, we just sit down and start yeah. Well, well it's always just send us, just send us the data. So yeah, if someone comes to our list or discussion groups and says, you know, I, I'm working with this uh, manufacturer of the microscope, can't use my image in the world. We just say, you know, can you just have one sample image, send us the data, we can then work on and implement a, a reader for the specific uh, format and bioformats. Mm -hmm. uh, which also means that bioformats is used, and that's the community uh, uh, aspect. Many projects use bioformats, like ImageJ, uh, Fiji, they rely on bioformats as a kind of general purpose library, which you can do as well, uh, due to the packaging and distribution uh, system around it. You basically can take bioformats and you know use it in other uh, other places as well. So uh, yeah, bioformats that's that's probably the that, that's that's the answer to your question. I think they currently they support 127 image formats. In your experience, your experience, you have some vendors which implement DRM algorithms. Uh, I don't really know anything about DRM, and I think, uh, as far as I know, there's no DRM in microscopy. No, that would be an extra level of meanness. I think the, the vendors are generally supportive. I don't think they are intentionally trying to. Exactly so. And I think that DRM is generally to prevent. The sharing of data. I mean, I think they they want to. Sh if you can acquire data on their instrument, they want to share it far and wide. Yes, and the microscopes are definitely patent to, to the heads. Um, the one thing I wanted to add by uh, answering your format question as well: uh, most of the formats we work with, the proprietary file formats, are TIFF based. So once we get around the, the kind of byte header, not going into so much detail, but once we uh, decode the first bytes, it then always falls back to an uh, image file uh, directory and it's easy to go from there. But yeah, so, so TIFF seems to be a predominant uh, storage format for proprietary. So, so your uh, investing in the uh, effort is a uh, light one? It, it really depends on the format. Yeah. I mean, uh, neither of us actually do that bit of the work, yeah. but I think sometimes it's, you know, it's not fun. But the especially the JPEG is that Yeah, I think it, I mean it's very time consuming. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh. Yeah. Um, how do you store these images? Ah, um, well, they're stored on a on a file system. Uh, but the metadata goes into a database. Uh, you want to alter object source? Um, don't you've got metadata already and other work space? No, d definitely it's something to look at in the future. Um, the project's been going for quite a long time, so there's a lot of uh, sort of legacy stuff going on. But I think definitely in, in the future that's something we should look at. No, I mean, I, could, I guess at about the first step, the next, next iteration of the whole uh, main line we're working on. It's called the Merle FS, and it'll give you the possibility of basically importing the image, and on the file system, you'll see the original file as you got it from the acquisition system. So we are going away from a kind of a binary store more giving the user again the control of all, uh, all these files 
if you don't want to basically be logged, in, logged into OMTIF, you can still get the original CCI file or TV file back from the, the repository on the file system. So that's the that's situation of, of changes that we're introducing. One more? Yeah. Do you have some uh, example of um, script um, or, or of people uh, making, for example, machine learning on your... Uh, so I'm actually working on it right now. <laughs> We're going to have a big release probably in that month's time. So the size of the space would be in many companies. And we have a repository for uh, user uh, uh, provided scripts. So if someone wants to you know, say, oh, I came up with this really nice way of uh, phenotyping DNA or uh, working with image, then just uh, come to us or open a pull request on GitHub. We can then review the code and it will be available to the whole community. Especially if it's high quality decomposition algorithm. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.